Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Locked On Seminoles Road Show. It wasn't planned this way, but you got Drake on the road, you've got me on the road, but it's the same familiar voices in two unfamiliar places, bringing you your favorite daily Florida State sports talk show five days a week, Monday through Friday, unless we get busy. It's the off season. Y'all know how it is. We try to bring you Florida State takes, news, and all that stuff. Today is Mailbag Monday. We're going to talk about the running game. Can Florida State be a run, an ACC leader while running the ball next year? We're also going to get into a little more X's and O's on our offense. Is this a Pop Warner offense, or is it an offense that needed a year or two to learn what it wanted to be with the personnel it has, and now we'll see a better version of that? We'll let you know what we think. That and more, your questions coming to you now. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Folks, if you are a longtime listener, we love you. We do this for you. If you're a first-time listener, we hope you become one of those longtime listeners. So smash that subscribe button, turn on alerts, and you too can become one of the Locked On Seminoles faithful. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you for the the first, I guess it was a short question, but the question we talked about in pre-production. Thank you, Max. So question comes from MicroVenture Funding. I've never heard the name of more, but it sounds lovely. But thank micro, you for the question, Micro guy. or is it Michael? A, micro venture funding. He's got a headshot too. I guess that's a pretty damn good headshot. I might have to ask for it. Hey, buddy, I'm in. Uh, I'm in M and A too. Um, you know, hit me up if we're trying to. You're trying to fund any ventures. Always down. Is that his uh, Twitter handle is at Max Moody Seventeen, folks. If you want to uh, ask him for that, any of that, or also his take on Peeps, the most disgusting Easter candy. But Micro Venture Funding's question was: Is it a hot take to say FSU will lead the ACC? and rushing, and be ranked in the top 15 nationally? Is it a hot take? Uh, so first of all, good question. And the answer to both of those is yes. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be that would be a huge improvement. So we ran some quick numbers here. This isn't Max's math corner. But the leader in the ACC last year was UNC. They ran the ball for 2,763 yards. Number two in the ACC And it's important to tell you who number two is, by the way. It's Louisville at 2,728 yards. The reason those two teams are so similar in number, but so different in practice, is one did it with a QB. The other did it with a stable of running backs, right? Sam Howell is good on the ground, don't get me wrong. But of Louisville's 2,728 yards, a 1,000 of those were Malik Cunningham. So that's probably who we're more analogous to and who we're competing with. Also, um, what, what was the running back? Ty Jordan, I believe, from UNC. Ty? Ty Chandler was the running back. I almost said UNC. Ty Chandler, and I thought that was wrong. Ty Chandler actually left UNC. So I would bet your rushing leader next year is going to be Louisville if Malik runs for 1,000 yards again. So the point of that is you're going to need Jordan Travis to help you out a lot. You're going to lose your best back in Jay Sean Corbin. But we're hoping that Trey Benson, Lawrence Toa Philly, um, Trayshawn Ward, CJ Williams, or DJ Williams, CJ, uh, all these guys can can make up for it. Now, I talked about this last week, and the first thing you have to do if you want to be the leader is you're going to have to run more plays. Last year, we ran average of 68.4 yards per game. UNC ran an average of 72.6 per game. That's a 6% delta there. It doesn't sound like a lot. But when you think about it, you can't be the leader in a category running 6% less plays because you're playing 6% less football throughout the year. Now, and it doesn't help also when your defense is also like you I think we said this in pre-production as well. If you're is if you're not that great on offense, you know, getting more plays, you better hope and pray your defense will not help and pray, but if your defense isn't as stout as it can be, that lets you get the ball back in the field as quick as possible. And then you're also yeah. mentioning with the stable of running backs I mean, to me, I mean, it's more going to be Syracuse. You might have to watch Syracuse with a um, with Sean Tucker and also with Garrett Schrader coming back. And we all remember Garrett Schrader last year who basically showed his best 2020 Jordan Travis impersonation where he was just running up the muck, running, running a muck field. So I think that's actually probably someone you need to 
watch a little more out for, honestly. Yeah, those were some bizarre runs, though. Um, we just like forgot that he could run, which was really, really weird. Sorry, folks. I'm it, it, just a little bit of behind the scenes here. I'm at my parents' house for the next couple of weeks, hence the uh, cool backdrop. Calvin Johnson jersey. Dad went to Georgia Tech, despite being a huge Florida State supporter. See all my Florida State memorabilia over next to the fishing poles, so we balance it out. Um, but yeah, I, I think that Jordan Travis will have to be a big part of it. Last year, he ran for 560 yards. And one thing I've heard that is interesting, but I don't know where it came from, was that somehow if he plays as many, if he plays all the games, he will run less. And that would have made, or he will run the same. That would have made sense in like 2019 or 2020 almost even when you saw him come in as a dedicated runner in games he didn't throw much. But last year, very rarely did he come in just to run the ball. So if he had 550 rush, rushing yards last year, if he plays all 12 games, he's probably going to bump up to seven or 800, right? Maybe he has a great year and goes over a thousand, but that's, those are like, he's being talked about for New York if he runs for a thousand probably. So I won't go that high, but he, he has, he's probably going to add 250, 300. So that means you have to have last year's production, right? Because Florida State last year was eighth in the ACC with 2,133 yards. So to beat Let's just say someone, right? Because UNC and Louisville both broke that 2,700 mark. So someone's going to get about 2,700 to be your leader, which is about a 30% delta from what you ran last year. So Jordan Travis can give you another 300 yards. And you get, so you get yourself up to, let's say, 20, what would that be? 25, 24, 33. That'd be around 2477. Yeah, that'd be 2433. So that would put you 14% off. So you're going to need this year's backs to beat last year's production by about 15% if Jordan Travis can also give you whatever that was, about a 20% bump in production just from staying healthy. So is it and impossible? No. Nothing's impossible, but, but I don't think it's going to happen. And I think that's kind of what you're alluding to with here, especially because we have a new run running back coming in and Trey Benson replacing Jason Corbin. Now I personally have the belief that Trey Benson at the end of the year will surpass what Jason Corbin did here, but we've already seen with Mike Norvell. He doesn't like giving these backs 15 to 20 carries. And typically when we see a running back, you know, coming into the game, you're leading the running backs hot. And typically you saw last year where I think the max carries overall for a running back was what 13, maybe 14, like on a good day. And then with Jordan, I mean, we brought a lot of wide receivers in for a reason. So I think we're definitely going to be seeing a little more movement to not passing the ball all the time, but definitely going to have more options in the passing game. I see it as a, as a top five rushing, um, top five offense in general, that like potentially. But to me, if you want to do, I mean, sorry, I see it as a top five rushing offense with just rushing yards in total. But I just think overall the way Norvell schemes up his play calling, I don't see us as the, as the number one option out there when you have a Sean Tucker, a Louisville with, with Malik Cunningham who, I mean, you mentioned New York. That kid is a dark horse candidate for New York right now. Absolutely. Yeah, at, at 100%. Um, the question was, is it a hot take? I'm going to say not really, because here's why. If we ran last year, if we, sorry, if we ran this coming year, as many plays on average across the board as we ran at home last year. And for those that missed Max's math corner, last year you ran on average 68.4 plays per game while you were like total across the season, but you ran 73.8 plays per game at home. So if you increase your rushing attempts by the 8% delta between the number of plays you ran on the everywhere and the number of plays you ran at home, you add that 8% increase. Well, you're now running the ball 481 times instead of 446, which means you're running for 2,517 yards if Jordan gives you an extra 200 yards. So 200 yards from Jordan, 8% more plays. You are only 9% off of last year's leaders. So is it a hot, 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 spicy, hot take to say that this stable of backs could give you, if two other things go your way, 10% better production than last year? I don't think that's that crazy. Is it going to happen? Drake, you've given the people a lot of reasons why it won't. I don't think you're wrong by any means. But... It's not crazy to think that this could be a top three team in the ACC for rushing next year. Before we get to the next one, I got to tell you all about what keeps me going, and that's Built Bar. Like I said, long day today. Tired. The family had me up super early, and I love them for it. I wouldn't want to do it any other way, but boy, I got to tell you, 
we had French toast at like 7 a.m. And your boy is not a 7 a.m. eater. So around like 10 o'clock, my stomach's doing a Pippin impression. It's like, yeah, we've had one breakfast, but what about second breakfast? And fortunately, when I travel, I bring my Bilt Bars with me. So I had second breakfast right there. Boom. Bilt Bar, 17 grams of protein, only five grams of sugar and five grams of carbs. Tell you what, folks, that's what made me able to sit there on the laptop while, you know, my daughter was watching a little Paw Patrol, bang out some work, be ready to go. So whatever you need it for, you need nutrition and you need good taste, make sure you get Built Bars. I don't know why this company is crazy. They still give you 15% off. Makes no sense to me. I think they should raise their prices by 15% because of inflation, but they'll give you a 15% discount at Built.com when you use promo code LOCKED15. So go to Built.com, promo code LOCKED15. All right, my favorite question we've got comes from, I already forgot his name. It says, go Canes. Fuck you. Moving on. Folks, we love doing Mailbag Mondays, and I love coming to y'all every single day. Make sure you mash that subscribe button, all that good stuff. Michael Ayers says, I believe it's Ayers, or maybe it's Hears. There's an H in there. They need to quit running that Pop Warner offense. Uh... Gosh, Driz, I I never agreed with a comment so much in my life. I mean, I think they run more of – look, I think last year they ran a high school offense. I think Willie Taggart ran a Pop Warner offense. This offense isn't as gadgety and gizmo as, as Willie Taggart's, but, like, it's not much better. That being said – when we talked to a friend of the show, Mike Moose Lewis, he's a high school coach at Godby High School, which is a pretty solid program. He talked about you can how you can really tell how good a team is when they're getting punched in the mouth. What do they do, right? Do they go to their fundamentals or do they try gadgety, really tricky stuff? Because a good team, when they're like, okay, we're getting a little out of our skis, this team's better than we thought, they go to the fundamentals. Look at Florida State in 2013. When they were losing in that in that championship game, they they busted out a fake punt. But when it came down to the wire, like when it was time, like, hey, let's drive down the field, what did they do? They gave the ball to Devontae Freeman. They threw the ball to Rashad Green. They baited a guy into an offense or defensive pass interference call that they knew they could probably get in the end zone. And then they went to Kelvin Benjamin. If y'all were watching that season, you knew the plays that were coming. Max, where's this rant going? So did I, that was the problem. <laughs> well, right in the first <laughs> half. But my, my point is that as Willie Taggart's team struggled, and this isn't like crapping on Taggart, it's just giving you some perspective from how I see it. When Willie Taggart's team struggled, like look at Virginia, they would go to crazy gadgety stuff, right? Like let's try to run down to the two-yard line, not call a timeout, do a wildcat with Cam and make him throw a pass to the tight end and oh, no one knew the play and we lose to Virginia. You saw Norvell's teams last year when they were starting to get hit in the mouth against like a Louisville, they would try to get back to, okay, they're like, let's do our basic stuff. Now, their base is a bit more gadgety. It's a bit more gizmo -y. That's why I call it a high school offense. But I think having a full spring of Jordan Travis running the offense and getting to really see what they have, and I don't know, Drake, tell me if you agree or disagree. I think you're going to see more and more of Mike doing what Mike envisions the offense being like, and I think you'll see a natural progression to a more collegiate-style offense. One, I think me and you will talk a different episode where I think that there's a little more of an issue with Willie Taggart's offense when it came to the coordinator and also basically him not listening to what he should be doing running the ball. But we'll discuss it's that at a different time. Uh, but with it's, I think that's correct, but I think it's correct for a different reason. Um, I kind of meant we, Dave and I recorded the episode for Tuesday and Wednesday, folks. So when those drop, you'll, you'll hit, the, hit the little bell at the top of the corner because then you'll know when they drop immediately at 7 a.m. But we discussed how that Jordan Travis has a lot more, I guess, weaponry around him now do we know the weaponry if it's solid or, or if it's you know effective we won't know that until you know we play lsu david duquesne will be just mainly a dress rehearsal but i do think that now with jordan travis he is known as, as qb number one this is the first time i think in camp since ever at all period that he is known as the true bona fide starter and now he has micah Pittman, johnny wilson he has keishan helton and ontario wilson he also has trey benson Trayshawn Ward, DJ Williams, Lawrence Philly, and a average offensive line. Not elite, not even good, but a simply average offensive line. 
And now we need to see whether or not I think Norvell wants to see if Jordan can take that next next step into being a serviceable, solid passer for actually to a lot of the concepts that he wants to do. And that's kind of why the spring game left a little bit of a weird taste in a lot of people's mouths where the bullets aren't flying and Jordan seemed a little more, I guess, going back to bad mechanics. So I think that's more what Norvell wants to see overall. And that's kind of where kind of where the offense will be leading towards that. But then also, you got to also understand that Jordan is going into his fourth year as a quarterback, right? He's going into his third year under Norvell. That's probably his main, you know, quarterbacks coach. Tony Tokars was how was promoted simply for, for to keep the continuity from Kenny Dillingham. No question, Jordan improved from last year. If you watched football last year and don't think he improved, then I don't know what the hell to tell you about sports. But when you see him in the live games there, it's like it's gotten to the point now where maybe this is just what Jordan is because he's so far down the line that maybe just maybe like He's he's solid. He's de- like when he's dependable, he's a solid option back there. But if, I don't know if you can ask if we're able to ask much more from him when it comes to actually passing the ball like on the field, like we fans not only want him to, but if we want to do take that next step to where we discussed should win games, could win games, or will win games to actually go past the eight, the uh, go around the eight win mark. Yeah, so this is pretty nuts, man. Jordan Travis from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty one, his completion percentage went up from fifty five percent to sixty two point nine. Nice. Nice. That's well, not what was a that seven. Yards per attempt though. Hang on. That who who cares? They were almost equal. Right. So complete more passes, you the ball is gonna go further, right? Because you're you're getting the same number per catch. You're now completing 15% more of your catches. I don't want to sound like I'm I'm condescendingly explaining, but it's not as simple. 55 to 63 is not eight percent. That's a 15% increase in passes completed. So if you get the same number of passes per completion, you get 15% more yards by completing 15% more passes. So my point is, if you've played golf, oh, I can't minimize, okay, whatever. If you've played golf and you've improved substantially, you're going to be able to track this metaphor. If you haven't, I'll try to find one for you. But when you first go from 120 strokes a game to 90, it's very quick and very obvious because you're working on big shit. Don't slice your driver out of bounds. Hit the ball relatively straight. Going from 85 to 79, it's six strokes, but it's very difficult because you're working on the small things and it requires a lot more work. You're working on sinking your 12 footers, right? Which is tedious to practice because it's not as easy as swing fixes. So what Jordan is working on now- Or fun either. Or fun. But what Jordan needs to work on to go from a 55% passer to a 63% passer like he did from 2020 to 2021 was much higher level. It's big, noticeable stuff. To go from a 63% passer to where he wants to be at like a 67% passer, that is like smaller, more minute stuff that's going to cause more hesitation. It's going to look a little weirder with him trying to improve because frankly, most of us talking heads don't even know what it takes to do that, right? So nope. we're going to not know if it's happening then, until day one. But then I'm going to ask you because like that, is a big that is like a more it's a hard it's a more difficult jump it's kind of like when you're teaching Very. a baseball player like hey let me help you with your command with your off speed stuff i know you can throw 102 103 right. with your four seamer or two Good seamer example. but when you want you, you want control with the slider the curveball or even with the change they have a little bit of movement to be deceptive with the fastball it takes a lot more in, in the cage a lot more time do you think jordan has enough time to assuage the concerns of this fan base Wex, you could be from it's april now we're only five months away from football Thank God. We're only five months away actually from football. Do you think he's actually going to be able to make that sort of small enough adjust, like those small but very difficult adjustments actually when the season does start start to come around? It's a good way to That's hard it. to say small, yes or no. Small to. but difficult. Right. We won't know until we know, but frankly, I'll say two things to that. One, he doesn't have to assuage the fan base. He just has to do it. And he's got five months to do it. So my point was more, we expected – we expected a lot of him in 13 practices with four new, well, th- unfortunately, three new receivers. All of those, by the way, all three receivers, now nah, not two. So two of the three receivers were in his upper echelon of his targeting, right? Like, hey, these need to be, you know, in your top three or four of targets. That's a lot to ask of a guy in 12 practices, 13 practices. So my point is like, That's you're fair. right. It may not happen, but let's not panic after 13 practices that he hasn't made this huge jump because what he's working on is going to take a lot of work over the summer. It's player. So, so let me walk people through what we have in the summer. First, they've got player led practices. So that's them all going out there. Some GAs that maybe, uh, 
maybe have talked to a coach or two. Who knows? You know, coaches aren't involved, right? Right, Scott Frost? Um, and they're, uh, they go out there, and they do some player-led stuff. And that's getting rhythm down. That's getting timing, practicing the route tree. Then he's going to do stuff on his own. That's going to be the proverbial. They don't do this anymore. I hope there's newer stuff. But the, the, the throwing to the tire swing, right? And then they have 30 days of fall camp. And then they're going to have a warm-up game. And then they're going to have two weeks. And then he's going to play LSU. And there's no rule that says he has to be the best he's ever going to be at LSU. Then he's going to have two more weeks until a game. So my point is like, there's a lot of time and you may be right, but let's not panic based on what we saw in the spring game. Cause it's still oh, yeah. very early in the process. But to me, it's more that we, like you're saying, like it's, it's five more months. I'm just worried now that it's five years into his collegiate career here. No, sorry, not even here. Just because being in college in general sure. or four years. Sorry with the math. My math is terrible. I'm just why I'm a lawyer. So to me, it's like every, so is it so far gone and so far down the road now where it's like, it's a little bit you know, habitual and it's really more, a lot more difficult to get those bad habits out and to make those small little tweaking improvements. Cause that's, it's hard, man. Cause that's, it's not easy. And that's, and it's asking a lot of a kid who quite frankly, wasn't even going to be seen as a starter at his previous spot. And I love Jordan Travis, but like, it's, it's not easy being a power five QB, especially at what we're, we're, where we need him now. I understand what you're saying. It's not invalid, but to me, he's not going into his fifth year. He's going into his second, right? Because I look at this stat line. 2018 at Louisville, he threw 14 passes. 2019, he threw 11. And you don't learn from practice. You learn, well, you do, because I'm saying five months is a long time. You need to get some game reps. So this is indicative of if he's throwing 11 passes during the year, what's he doing in practice, right? Then 2020, he threw 131 passes. Shortened season. COVID was going around. He was not cemented as the starter before the season. In fact, we've talked, excuse me, we've talked about this ad nauseum. We feel like Norvell was basically forced to start him in 2020. We actually had Jordan Travis as high school coach on this program, and he essentially said that Jordan can be the best quarterback you've ever had, but you have to design the offense for him. Is that good or bad? You, the listener, can decide on that point. My point there is that midway through the season, he's brought through to this brand new offense, and Norvell doesn't really know how to use him, and he throws the ball 131 times. So let's go into last year. Still not given the starting job before the season because of an injury in fall camp, he threw the ball 194 times. Mackenzie Milton threw the ball. I actually wish I'd pulled his up, but off the top of my head, I think he threw the ball around 140 times. So he still only had half of your passes last year. Now let's look at the improvement from 2020 to 2021, despite not throwing how many passes a quarterback should throw in either of those years. In 2021, he improved his completion percentage, like I said, by 15%. Improved his yards by a full 50%. Right, went from a thousand yards in 2020 to 1500 yards in 2021. He had the same number of interceptions in 2021 as in 2020, but triple the touchdowns. So when people say, and you're not saying this, you said he shut you up. I'm just saying this to the people now. I'm not. I'm not going at you. When people say, "Well, he's got to take this huge leap," folks, he did take a massive leap from 2020 to 2021, and he wasn't even told he was going to be the starter until two games in, three games in. So now, doesn't it kind of stand to reason that we should give him the benefit of the doubt and let's see what it looks like in the fall? Because he's done it once, and he can do it again. I mean, he can, and I really hope he does. Hey, listen, I don't mind being wrong. You fucking know that. But um, In this case, I would mind being wrong because it'd be bad for the team, but typically I don't. (laughs) (laughs) No, I know what you're saying. But, I mean, like, he can totally do that again. And, I mean, he made the jump last year because, like I said, like, I mean, we had Eric Crusher in the program too, and like he's, I'm in the camp where like if you have to design the, the, the if you have to design the offense around a specific quarterback with that, that that like with that much of a niche of a kind of a skill set, it's going to limit your entire offense overall, and it's going to hurt your team. But to me, it's like you're saying, uh, it's a lot of the mechanics of it's a lot of the, the fine small little details that he needs to work on, and it's not easy to do because a lot of it now is habitual, and that's just kind of more. Kind of where I'm sitting with that. That's about it. But I do think he has earned the BOTD. I'm not panicking after the spring game. Mine is more of a seeing it as his, his resume as a whole. That's about it. Yeah. No, I'm with you, man. Again, to, to your point's valid. I, I like to think mine is that to me, his resume shows he improves drastically each year. Um, but I don't really trust the coach he's under. Sorry, Tokars. I just don't yet. So we're going to have to see, man. But I want to get to a couple more questions before that, folks. The lights get kept on here by a couple people, and one of the most loyal of those is Bet Online. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Tokars. 
Is that's where we're cut off. Yeah, it's at mine. But hey, you know, whatever. Folks, the lights get kept on here by a couple people. Uh, Bet Online is one of those loyal and faithful sponsors that we've had since day one. They make sure that you get your Seminoles talk every single day, five days a week. BetOnline.net has odds. They've got props. They've got everything that you need to keep the action rolling. You got middle fingers being tossed in the NBA playoffs right now. You got golf going on. The NHL playoffs are coming up. There's all kinds of stuff. Heck, college baseball, if you're into that. Florida State just uh, just swept Louisville, number nine in the country, I believe. So go find 10, whatever. It depends on where you look. So go find whatever you want, whatever action you need. BetOnline.net is your source. BetOnline.net, where the game starts. Hey, folks, like I said, we are in the mobile command center, which means that sometimes there are difficulties. Right now, my video is not cooperating, so you are going to get Drake's face and my voice. Drake, proceed. So, shout out to Timmy. He gave us our last question. Well, thematic, I guess, theme message of the night. He said, I took the spring game with a grain of salt. As I kind of said before, that's kind of how you should take the spring game. It's more that you look towards improvements for certain players overall because it's a global fried scrimmage. But, he ended up by saying, excited for our defense, though. Now, Max, I kind of wanted to pull this and kind of ask you this, because I don't think I've seen you actually kind of go deeper dive with this kind of question. How do you feel about the defense actually heading into next year? Now, I know we lost Jermaine Johnson, Kier Thomas, two defensive ends. Jermaine Johnson is about to be a top 10 pick for the NFL. Kier Thomas is going to definitely be drafted. And we also lost Jarvis Brownlee, who was probably the most impactful piece of our secondary last year. So overall, do you feel more confident, actually, that the team can not only meet the expectations of last year, but also surpassing, kind of get, get towards that top 40 defense that kind of we've seen because it feels like our, D, our this team will only go as far as how good our defense is. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we don't talk about the defense enough. I think that we spend a little too, not too much time talking about the offense because you can never truly spend too much time talking about the offense. But um, defense is going to be a huge part of the equation. I don't know if it's because we've sort of taken it for granted and we just assume the defense is going to be better than the offense. So we feel the need to talk about the offense more, but the reality is if you look at the advanced stats, right from like football outsiders in F plus, we were 52nd in the country last year or 49th in the country. I apologize. That's not that bad. Sorry. That's, that's overall my bad. We were 49th overall. We were 39th on defense and 57th on offense. So you look at that delta, right? And I'm, I'm using footballoutsiders.com F plus metric between being the 39th best team in one area and the 57th best in the other. You're going to talk about that 57th because it stands to reason if your 39th could come up, could stay stagnant and just hold firm. And then your 57th could get on pace with that, right? And be 39th. Obviously, it's never a one-to-one like that. But that would obviously make you 39th overall, which will put you at Houston's level or Appalachian State's level or Oregon's level. Oregon was 9-4, and four, beat Ohio State. Houston, 11-2. and two. Appalachian State, 9-4. and four. So, so you talk about if you could just hold firm on defense and get your offense up to the same level you're looking at being the same level as Oregon, Houston, or Appalachian State, well, then you're like pretty excited about a year like that, right? I mean, you look at, in fact, this is wonderful. I promise I didn't make this up. 39th on offense last year. So you were 39th on defense. 39th on offense last year was Florida. If you could have a season like Florida's, win a couple more games, but like take Alabama down to the wire and don't just give up down the stretch and beat Florida. You're pretty excited about your year. So I don't know that the defense needs to get substantially better. They just got to hold firm where they are. I'd like to see them improve substantially, but they don't need to. Do I think that they can be just as good next year as they were last year? Absolutely. It will look a little different. But I think your secondary as a whole is vastly improved, at least in depth, than they were the year before. And I think that your defensive line is actually deeper but doesn't have anyone with the skill level of Jermaine Johnson, but in the aggregate will look very similar. And finally, I think that your linebacking core, if everyone stays healthy with the addition of Tatum Bethune and everyone being older is a lot better. I mean, I can get behind that. And we're also seeing now that in my personal opinion, I think the actual 
the promotion of Randy Shannon to Code DC actually kind of will be actually a good thing because primarily we saw Chris Marv actually leave and become a defensive coordinator over at Virginia Tech. And to me, I think Chris Marv had a lot to do with the improvement on that defense. I mean, when, when Brent Pry, who is, the, who is the new head coach at PT, when he actually is very well-respected when it comes to defensive play calling and he hand-selects Marv as his, well, someone he wants to have actually, actually with him under his first head coaching gig, that speaks a lot. And I'm pretty sure that Shannon and Marv had a lot of conversations about how to improve the defense. And that's what we saw from the second half of Louisville on. The defense was playing a lot more to what we expected of them. And then to me, the personnel overall, I, I do agree with you where we like no one's going to replace Jermaine Johnson. That's extremely unfair to ask of any individual personnel actually on the team and also anywhere in the country because that kid, as I said before, is going to be a top 10 pick. But I do like what we saw out of Jared Verse. I don't think he's going to start game one because he's still acclimated to power five speed. But I think by around the way Louisville or Boston College game, he will definitely be getting the, primary, the majority of snaps from the end position. But we also have Dennis Briggs. Robert Cooper, Fabian Love, and on along the front, Quayshon Fuller is all still there. Derek McClendon, and then we discussed Tatum Bethune, who to me he didn't play the spring game. He was held off for precautionary reasons, but to me, him and Kalen Deloach are finally the, the a solid twosome we see up in the middle of the entire defensive uh, the entire defensive unit, similar to how Christian Jones and Telvin Smith were basically the leaders of the entire defense. Now I'm not saying they're the same quality, obviously, but when you have that sort of stability in the middle going out kind of middle out middle out kind of compression middle right out. there yeah you got good to middle me, out. That, it helps your entire yeah yeah good little middle out it, it, to me it helps actually your entire defense be fundamentally sound overall and be able to improve from last year which defense that overall at the end looked actually pretty decent this all remains to be seen we have five months until football season starts and we will be here with y'all five days a week thanks for stopping by that's drake i'm max and this was Locked On Seminoles.